everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know about the Atlanta Photography Group, uh, it was established in 1987 and is an artist-initiated nonprofit 501c3 organization. We are membership supported and we provide opportunities and support for the fine art photography community. Um, welcome, thank you for joining us. I hope to see you at future events. Um, our sponsors and grants, APG is generously funded by the Lubo Fund, the City of Atlanta Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs, Fulton County Board of Commissioners, and the Georgia Council for the Arts through the appropriation of the Georgia General Assembly. The Georgia Council for the Arts also receives support from its partner agency, the National Endowment for the Arts. Tonight, we have our virtual opening with our juror talk with Sarah Kennel, including a dialogue with the featured photographers. There will be some individual artist talks coming up very soon. So keep your eye on our social media and our website for the dates and times for those. Folio is the Atlanta Photography Group's prestigious annual juried exhibition. Each year this exhibition features the projects of six to eight photographers chosen by a nationally recognized curator. And we are so pleased to have Sarah with us this year. Um, there is also a purchase award of $2,500 as part of this exhibition. The High Museum has the opportunity to select work from an artist in this exhibition for their permanent collection pending museum approval. APG will purchase the work from the artist and donate to the High Museum. Since 2017, this award has been sponsored by APG donors Edwin Robinson and the estate of Ted Malou. Featured artist this evening is Allison Grant from Alabama, Beata Sass from Georgia, Eric Koonsman from New York, Karen Bullock from Alabama, Mark Caceres from Georgia, Mari Gortmiller from Georgia, Michael Joseph from Massachusetts, and Terry Darnell from Georgia. There's an additional alternate portfolio and single images, um, and you can see the names there. There's also online galleries available on our website for all of the artists, um, and we will be looking at their work this evening as well. I would like to introduce Sarah Kennel as our juror this year. I'm very pleased that she was able, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm very pleased that she was able to uh, jury this exhibition and I'm really excited about the work that she has chosen. Sarah is the High Museum of Arts Curator of Photography. Kennel joined the High in July of 2019 from the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, where she oversaw an extensive collection of pho photographs dating from 1839 to the present and managed an active and global, globally oriented photography program. While at the Peabody Essex, she co-curated the critically acclaimed touring exhibition, Sally Mann, A Thousand Crossings, organized by the Peabody Essex and the National Gallery of Art, which opened at the High in October of 2019. At the Peabody Essex, she developed the first strategic plan for the photography department and spearheaded important gifts. Kennel previously served for nine years as curator at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., where she helped oversee the photography collection and manage an active exhibition. Acquisition and research program. Highlights include exhibitions and accompanying catalogs for Charles Marville, Photographer of Paris, The Serial Portrait, Photography and Identity in the Past 100 Years, and In the Darkroom, Photographic Processes Before the Digital Age. As an art historian, Kennel has written and contributed to many publications, including the catalog for Sally Mann, A Thousand Crossings, with co-curator Sarah Greenow of the National Gallery of Art, which was awarded Best Photographic Book at the 2018 Festival International de l'Ouvre d'Art et du Film. She has taught at Princeton University, the University of California in Berkeley, and George Washington Un University. And her numerous fellowships and awards include the Samuel H. Crest Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellowship and the Mary Davis Pre-Doctoral Fellowship at the Center for the Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, both at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Kennel earned a doctorate and a Master of Arts in Art History from the University of California in Berkeley and a Bachelor of Arts from Princeton University. It is my pleasure to turn over um, our event to Sarah um, and have her uh, give us her insights on the exhibition. 
Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Judith and Chip and everybody at Atlanta Photography Group for inviting me to um, jury this year's portfolio selection exhibition. Um, it's definitely an unusual process always to jury a show. Um, this is also my first time giving a talk without wearing shoes. Um, we're all experimenting with new things here, um, but I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to see so much tremendous work. Um, and I thought I would just start out by telling all of you a little bit about what is behind the selection process for me. Um, a few people sent questions in in advance, and one of them was, um, how you know how do museums form their collections, and how does the high, for example, decide what to collect? Um, and if we have time, I will uh, get to that question later. But I wanted to start off by saying that one of the sheer pleasures of being able to jury something like this is that um, you can really respond uh, very intuitively and subjectively. You're not thinking about how does it fit into the collection, how much does it cost, um, you know, is you know, is does, is there an overlap? Does it open up a new area that you know my director isn't interested in? All of those kinds of considerations go out the window, um, and it really has uh, opens up um, the chance to just kind of respond to work that's being made now. Um, the second thing I will say is that. Um, Every juried um, process is different, um, but I was incredibly pleased, surprised, and overwhelmed by the range and also the quality of the submissions. Um, there were so many that I liked and loved, and in the end, having to make that selection was very difficult. Um, and um, there were a lot of works that, you know, on a, at a different moment, might have made it in. Um, so if you are one of those photographers, take heart. Um, uh, the juring process is really, really a subjective one. And that's the third thing I want to get at is, um, what was I looking for here? Um, so one of the things I wanted to think about was how this exhibition is a little bit different than other maybe APG exhibitions in that it is a portfolio review, uh, I mean, a portfolio exhibition. So portfolios or really give an artist an opportunity to show you how they are working through an idea or a project. And these can be constructed in different ways. And we'll see different approaches to what a group might be or a series, whether it's a typology, whether it's a narrative, um, or something in between. Um, and I think that that is really where, um, for me, how an artist chooses her materials or his materials to um, really address and work through an idea. That's what intrigued me about a lot of these works that I've selected. Um, the second thing is that I am new to the South and I found myself uh, when, you know, Judith put up the list of artists and where they were from. I mean, you could see there was a significant group of artists from the South. Um, and that's partly probably reflective of people who are engaged with Atlanta Celebrates Photography, uh, excuse me, Atlanta Photography Group. Um, but also I think what, where I am now in my own interest is really trying to um, better understand the landscape of contemporary practice, especially in the South. Um, but then some things emerged that um, I only understood in retrospect. Um, and this is where the kind of intuitive um, and very subjective process comes in. Um, a show that I had juried many years ago, uh, I, I arrived the day that uh, it was being hung and it struck me for the first time that 60 to 70% of the exhibition was portraiture. Um, and of course I'd received all kinds of submissions. Um, and it was probably no coincidence that I was in the middle of putting together a show on portraiture. So I was really, thinking about the medium. Um, and that was what I was gravitating towards. Um, in this um, selection, I looked back just when I was putting my notes together and I realized that there are actually a number of these series that deal with questions of um, family and domesticity um, and parenting, motherhood. Um, and I think that that might have to do with my recent work on Sally Mann. Um, and for that catalog, I wrote about kind of depictions of motherhood. It may also have to do with the fact that in the last couple months, like many of 
you. I've been trying to balance work and parenting in the same space. Um, so suddenly the domestic sphere and interpersonal relationships seem to come to the fore. Um, so that's just a little bit of um, kind of background and how um, these processes work for me. Um, the other thing um, that uh, is always um, interesting is that uh, the digital process, I, I review all of these works digitally. I get a group of photographs. I look at them on my computer screen, which is not ideal. I read the artist's statement, but you never really know what it looks like in person. And I'm still at heart uh, oriented towards the physical. I love being able to see these exhibition uh, installation shots, and I am going to see the exhibition hopefully next week whenever we can arrange an appointment because this is what I live for. It's the in-person encounter. Um, but during by digital is, is really an imperfect process. We do the best we can with it, um, but very often we really miss the things that um, transform something from an image into a photograph, into an object, um, with kind of its own life and presence. Um, the other thing we miss in this selection, but we get to see here, at least on the screen, is the way that objects speak with each other. And it looks like it's been really beautifully and thoughtfully arranged. Um, that's always the fun part of curating, too, is thinking about the conversations that can happen uh, between different kinds of pictures. Um, Normally, I have the experience of during digitally and then being able to go to the opening and say, wow, look at that. That's so amazing. Um, so it's a little bit of delayed gratification tonight, um, but it only makes my excitement that much greater. Um, so what I'd like to do next is um, go through the portfolios uh, one by one. I have just a few thoughts on each one that I'd like to share with you. And I believe that most of the artists are here tonight, which is fantastic. And I might ask them to speak a little bit about their work or ask a question uh, of them. And I thought we'd start with the work of Allison Grant, um, who is uh, in our um, region in Alabama. And um, I believe that this body of work uh, was something that um, intrigued me because it brought together two things that um, I don't often see, um, just trying to pull my notes, my daughter's computer, I don't often see together, and that is um, the uh, very quiet, deliberate, thoughtful focus on the domestic sphere, and these pictures very much are looking at uh, parenting and motherhood, but it's grounded in a much larger geopolitical issue, which is um, the environment and climate change. And so um, uh, Ms. Grant has written about the process of raising her children in an area that is beset with environmental problems, including toxic waste. And of course, we know that these processes are not only changing the physical landscape um, and the ecosystem, but also pose health hazards, some known and some unknown, um, especially to developing um, individuals to children. And so she's tied these two things together through these pictures that um, have a quality to them that is sort of marries a sense of intimacy and beauty with a kind of ominous tone to them. Um, and I think that that title within the bittersweet uh, really gets at that kind of sense of um, the fragility, both of the environment, but also of childhood. Um, the picture just before this one, um, I thought was really interesting, the change in perspective. And um, we are both very close to her daughter, I assume it's the photographer's daughter, and Allison can speak in a minute. Um, but also we're looking at this really unexpected perspective where it seems that she's, she's lie down, but she could also be falling. Um, unless, of course, the picture is <laughs> perhaps supposed to be the other way. We had a few questions, of course, during the um, putting together the slides, whether we had them oriented correctly. So you it's, can tell. It's right, but I'm not sure which way <laughs> I took it. <laughs> so anyway, um, I really, I think this particularly coming after the, pro after the project with Sally Mann and those family photographs really were looking at childhood as something at both idyllic but also at risk, I responded to these works. And now I'd just like to um, kind of invite Allison to say a few words about the genesis of this project and, and where it might be going next. 
Sure, thank you so much. That was really, can everyone hear me? Um, okay, great. Um, that was that was great. And um, yeah, the project actually started to form in my mind um, when I was on maternity leave with my first daughter, although I didn't start it until right after I had my second daughter. Um, and you know, when you have children, when you have an infant, your world really contracts to this very small space inside of your house. Um, and so I had never really experienced anything quite like that. But what was really interesting to me about it is as my actual space that I was inhabiting contracted, I felt this connection to this expansive and cyclical way of thinking about time where I would nurse my daughter and I would feel like I could see my mother nursing me and her mother nursing her. And I would also almost imagine my own daughter, if she decides to have children of her own, you know, learning these rituals and going through these same processes that so many women throughout time have. And before I had children, I had been doing a lot of research and work um, related to climate change. And so naturally, as I was thinking about the progression of time and the world that my daughter was going to inhabit, these experiences that she was going to have, um, climate change was intersecting directly with, with that set of ideas. And, you know, you can kind of think of climate change as um, having more of a linear timeline. And so I wanted to when I started to think about making this work, hold those two things in tension. And I think there are many things in this project that are sort of held in tension, the sort of beauty and the, you know, the sort of um, toxins and, you know, these, these many sort of um, points of tension. And so um, when I first started making the work, I was making these very performative images that were trying to sort of illustrate this. But as I started looking out into the landscape that we live in and thinking regionally about how this um, issue of climate change is expressed, I started making pictures of um, various toxic sites that are, um, right now they're within 100 miles of my family. That's sort of been the, I guess, time limit of having children and not being able to go out <laughs> you know, too far, too far afield. And also I'm really wanting to think about how our health and well-being is impacted in the present and also potentially in the future. Um, and I think that motherhood provides certain forms of knowledge and ways of seeing the world that are very specific. Um, I think this is probably true of parenthood generally, but I'm, 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 I feel very much relate, I can relate to the idea of motherhood, but um, I think that th those types of knowledge and those ways of understanding existence are sometimes marginalized or not treated with the level of um, impact that they have on, on real people's lives. And so I wanted to elevate that with this work as well. Um, and I, I don't know where it's going next. <laughs> um, the whole world just seems to be upside down. I've got a couple of projects that I'm, um, you know, still chewing on to come after this one and I'm still working through this one as well. So I'll probably continue to make this one in um, a relatively similar fashion over the next year or two. Um, and then we'll see where things go from there. I think it's um, a really interesting project and probably has even changed its meaning in the last couple of months. When I first viewed these, this was pre-virus, right? We all have the before and the after. And I was thinking a lot about Greta Thunberg and sort of the world that our youth is inheriting. I also have children eight and 10 and I, and I, I worry about that. Um, but I also think that in this moment too, we're grappling with um, a threat that is kind of hard to grasp, unseen, binds us in ways that we don't anticipate and has the possibility of either bringing us together or further dividing us. And, you know, in a way, the, the biological dynamics of the virus and the threat of climate change um, are similar. I mean, there are opportunities we have to, um, to address, work together, to understand, to heal, um, uh, you know, and to, to realize that we're all interconnected and our actions impact others. Um, so in, in a way, you know, I'm having conversations with my kids about the coronavirus, but um, it's similar to the ones I've had with them about, you know, why we recycle and climate change and things like that. So it, it's interesting how um, the same body of work accrues different meanings, you know, um, what we bring to it at any one time. So um, thank you for sharing that great portfolio. And um, I look forward to seeing where it goes and look forward to seeing it in person. Um, and uh, I think our next one um, is, uh, am I pronouncing right, Beata? Correct. 
Bet. Okay. Bet Sass. Um, and um, oh, you get it right, Sarah. It's Beata. Beata. Sorry. It's, I guess my Zoom. Um, I should always go with my first instinct. Um, and um, this is also a project um, about childhood in a way. Um, but not necessarily about what we think of as, as mothering or parenting. Um, and uh, I live in Decatur, so I was totally um, fascinated by something I had never known about at all, which is um, the children's home, um, and, which is in the city of Decatur, you know, and um, that it, it was an orphanage run for uh, 144 years, uh, really up until 2017. And so this project is documenting, you were invited in and allowed to photograph the numerous buildings, um, something like 20, how many buildings, 27? Uh, 28. 28 buildings on this property, um, which of course have been in some cases emptied out of you know immediate personal effects, but retain so much of the sense of the lives lived in them. Um, and I think, you know, as you say in, in your narrative as well, um, that we don't get the sense of, you know, we, the, the scary orphanage, um, you know, but rather um, a, a community of caring um, where um, so many people grew up and had to make their own way through childhood in very different circumstances, a very different kind of family. Um, I think um, there were a lot of things I really liked about this portfolio. One of them was that um, I think since 2008 and the financial crash, there have been a lot of photographers, and I mean even before then, kind of drawn to ruins, drawn to abandoned buildings, drawn to spaces that have been emptied of their in, uh, occupants. Um, and, you know, there's a term for some of this, which is ruin porn. I mean, there's kind of a beauty in decay. Um, but uh, to me, these pictures were very respectful of the lives lived there. And it's not a frisson of something that was once amazing and is now kind of turned into decay, which we might think of as the sort of part of the, the sublime. Um, but rather um, sort of a desire to capture the traces and memories of individuals. And so here, you know, the, the handwriting, which we had in the last slide, Butch loves, I can't remember who it is, um, Beth, and then so what? I mean, we get the sense of, of, of kind of, you know, children, uh, but the beautiful handwriting, it's not really graffiti with this sort of, this, you know, wallpaper. Um, I also loved the first picture, which was the, I think, the decal on the wall of sort of a football player coming in, something very contemporary. And also, this is something that really only photography can do and play with the sense of two and three dimensions. So, you know, when I first saw this picture, I just kind of was like, what's happening here? You know, parachuting in. And then um, as you go on, you realize um, what the series is about. Um, and I think too, I was um, very, I became very interested in the story as a whole. And I was really pleased to learn, Beata, that this is part of an ongoing project that also includes interviews um, with uh, people who grew up there and documentary um, evidence. So I, I really look forward to hearing a little bit more from you about the whole picture um, as well of, of the children's home. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, you know, the, the images that you selected are just a very small part of this project. Um, I've been working on this for three years and I did most of the photographing in the first year and a half, but um, this project also included interviewing 16 individuals who either lived there as children from as early as 1943 through the 70s. Um, so individuals who lived there, who worked there, and also who volunteered there. Um, so really over the last year and a half or so, I've been culling through all those transcripts, transcriptions and trying to pull out the stories. And also at some point, in some cases, going back and kind of re-photographing some areas so that I can meld the stories um, with the photographs too. Um, looking at these pictures, it's hard to get a sense of those stories. You really have to look at the the whole project, which includes the stories and memories, the landscape, the buildings, um, the exterior, uh, the exterior portion of the of the campus as well. So this is just a little slice of that story. 
um, the, the interviews were probably the most important part of this project for me. Um, the stories are poignant, they're um, very revealing of the lives lived there. These children came um, really from very traumatic circumstances early on. They were children that were orphaned during the depression. They were, came from large families where families could no longer care for their children. Um, more recently, uh, 70s on, you've got addiction and other problems, um, problems with child abuse. So these children um, across the decades came here very traumatized and it's quite remarkable the amazing people and community that rallied around these these children um, I know I'm talking about the interviews and not the photographs but the stories are what always comes to mind and when I see these pictures I think of people's stories the things that they've shared with me I'm in the process of trying to create a book proposal because I think that's kind of the most complete way to view this work because it's all encompassing um, so that's what I'm working on right now is to trying to put the, the text together with the images. I've also collected historical images from the Pitts Theology Library in Emory. And I've, uh, I'm going to try to insert those into the story too. Some individuals gave me pictures. Most of the children, you know, they don't have pictures because they didn't have cameras. They didn't have family to take pictures of and so a lot of what they gave me were Xeroxes of photos that were given to them. So I really had to go searching for, for photographs. Um, I took some of the photographs and also placed the, the historical photographs and placed them in places at the home and re-photographed them, kind of trying to provide some context for those historical photographs. Um, so it's, it's, it's been quite a journey and it's, I've learned a lot. Um, the city of Decatur purchased this property and I think they've been very thoughtful about honoring the legacy of this property too, which has been very interesting for me. And we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that other people in the community will find value in learning more about the history of, the, of this place. Well, I think it's going to be a really interesting project. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued by the kind of tensions in your pictures and in your project between a sort of very documentary approach, um, but pictures that are also very much um, very carefully crafted uh, to, you know, help us think about form and space and light and obviously use of color. So it's a really, it's a nice, you know, balance between those. And it'll be interesting to see the um, archival documents uh, mixed in with that. So thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Sarah. All right. And I think um, up next is Karen Bullock. Yes. Um, is Karen here today? Yes, I'm here. Great. Hi, Karen. That's good. I don't want to put somebody Hi. on the spot. I'm not here. Hi. Um, and so this um, portfolio really drew me in, um, in part because, as I mentioned before, um, I am relatively new to the South and, and obviously have chosen several projects already that are kind of engaged with a sense of place, but also a, a kind of a culture. Um, and, um, you know, there's not too many photographic projects about faith that are successful. Um, Photography is the product in some ways of, uh, you know, science and materialism. And so one of the questions I think that this body of work, which I'll describe in a minute, in a minute poses is, you know, how, how do you use photography to access something as ineffable and intangible as faith? Um, and I think there's a couple different answers in your work, and it has to do with kind of light and color, but also sort of looking at the overlooked. Um, but as I understand it, this body of work came to you after a personal experience of, of trauma and loss, um, where you felt that you had perhaps a heightened sensation or attention in the world to things that seemed to be infused with the kind of spirit of um, yeah, we weren't sure about the way that one went, actually. That was a question we had. Um, and that uh, you noticed um, things you hadn't noticed before um, 
uh, that sort of drew your attention. And um, I think faith also is kind of investing um, into things, our, our own desires, beliefs, hopes. Um, so uh, I also really just love the use of color and light um, here, um, you know, sort of wondered how you had gotten some of those effects, whether, you know, they appeared, you, you captured them and here with the sort of the prism like look. So I would just invite you to tell us a little bit more about um, this project and maybe how it fits into um, other work that you're doing or whether this is being expanded as well. Sure, thank you. I, um, I guess something you said a minute ago really struck me and that was kind of honoring the stories of the space instead of looking at ruined porn. And I do photograph some churches that are closed or ruined, but most of these are not that. Um, but I, I, when I go in there, I think about who were the people who were in there that were praying and singing and what were their stories. And I'm always thinking about that when I'm in the space. So there's sort of this um, back and forth a little be between what is the history of this place and what do I feel here about it is more um, sort of intuitive. And then a deeply personal thing about going through trauma, which was, um, this came about after reflecting on a miscarriage I had. So again, that ties in with motherhood, but um, just feeling like God was in another room somewhere. And so the images, kind of look at that like there's a hint of God maybe in the light or a hint of the people who were here in the objects left behind and you know a sense of presence but then you can't really see that presence and to answer your question about the light this one was done well um, this one was done with um, light coming in through a window with like um, I don't know what you, like a prismatic plastic film kind of stuff on it um, the one with the the palm crosses the with the white swirly yes that one um that was in a church sacristy and they were um sitting on the counter there and there were these christmas lights the kind that swirl around on your house on the counter and i just plugged it in and that's what came about so um a lot of times they look for found light that's what i prefer and once in a while i interfere a little like with that one um, this was a sort of plastic stained glass window in a church in Grand Bay. Um, the pastor really wasn't, it wasn't her favorite. Uh, they have some nicer windows in the sanctuary, but I love this pink light coming through. I thought it was just amazing. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered all of your questions. I was just curious about also, um, the, the churches that you selected. I mean, did you did you have easy access to them? Did you explain sort of what you're doing? And, you know, um, did you start with one and it kind of kept going or? Um... Um, my work, oddly enough, because it looks nothing like his work, was um, the initial inspiration came from William Christenberry's work. And um, I like to travel. My husband's great with points and traveling inexpensively and stuff. And I was always thinking, I need to go someplace else to take pictures. But I saw his work and I just, I don't know, it, 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 it kept coming back to my mind over and over again. And so I started looking around home and it began as a broader series on the South and then narrowed down to the churches. And then I started exploring my inner feelings. So um, um, I sometimes drive around, go on road trips and just see what I see. And hopefully I see a church. Sometimes I scope them out on the internet and try to find um, places. And yeah, I do um, talk with the pastors and, um, you know, get permission to come in. Um, twice I've had the key to a church, which was really fun. They just gave me the key and they're like, just go photograph what you want. Um, so I love that because I, I really like to make the pictures in silence. I don't, if somebody's there talking to me the whole time, it's much more difficult for me to get into that space in my head and my heart and um, create the photos. Right. Well, thank you so much for thank you. These, and I can't wait to see them in person too. Yes. Um, and um, so I think yes, we've had sort of several 
portfolios that have been about childhood in different ways or mothering or that kind of domestic experience. Um, and then the next one um, by Mark um, is in a way it's also about family bonds, but it's about place and town and the complexity of individuals uh, in communities. Um, but as the additional interest for me as well about how do pictures tell stories in different ways than words. Um, this was a series I have searched for that was inspired by a nonfiction story account, Let Patsy Rest in Peace Rip, um, which is about the quest of one man to um, fulfill his wife's sort of dying wish, which was to bury her in the front yard of their home. Um, and the, all of the events that kind of unchained after that, the what appeared to be complex family relationships, um, uh, town issues, social norms. Um, these were made in Stevenson, Alabama, um, I guess where the events took place. And I'd love to hear when I'm done just talking about the pictures a little bit from Mark about what it was like to photograph there. And, and his own interaction with individuals been part of the story. Um, but one of the things that um, uh, in particular I really liked about this portfolio was um, the sense of a narrative, uh, particularly the undercurrent of, um, of words throughout, but words that don't always, they're not necessarily expository, but sometimes elliptical, or in this case kind of in the background um, and the way that a photographer might respond to a written story. Um, and then um, also the sense of the community um, in which the story takes place, um, particularly through these, these scenes of the windows, the American flag, um, and also even in this picture here, the sense there's kind of two sides to every story. There's, there's the surface of the window that we're seeing and then there's what's behind it and there's what's reflected. We have this kind of doubling of perspectives. And um, I suspect that that also comes out more fully in the way that um, the story plays out. Um, there are, um, and I hope that Mark can tell us a little bit about some of the individuals um, in the picture, um, but I also like the mixture of kind of portraiture, cityscapes, um these uh, kind of still lies this one <laughs> almost in a way relates to, to our last um our last portfolio um and um the sense of human emotion and how um something like grief um can color uh uh you know people's lives um, and perspectives and this to me is a is a picture about grief as well as um the one that's going to come up next um, but I think here, you even if you haven't read the story, which I haven't, you get a sense of what is happening in, in this, this story. And this to me was a, a picture too that was, it was a very powerful one um, that was about also the role of witnessing and photography and kind of um, marking, um, marking loss and just the way that uh, you know, the ritual of uh, burial is so significant. It's the kind of the crux of this, of this story. So is the act of making a picture. Um, and of course, here the picture within the picture. So to me, it's also kind of about people's faith in photography um, to, to kind of hold us to, to a version of the, of the truth and of experience. Um, so I'm now going to open it up to Mark and um, invite him to tell us a little bit about um, what got him interested in this um, the story to begin with and his own experiences photographing um, with members of Patsy's family and in the town. Yes, um, thanks. Um, this project really, um, I just kind of stumbled upon it. Actually, the author of the story that um, this is based on is a neighbor of mine. And he told me that he was working on the story. He had uh, read it about it in the National Press and uh, asked me if I was interested in taking photographs to support the, the story. And I said, of course. So um, we drove out there together. He introduced me to Mr. Davis, uh, the main character in the story. 
And uh, Mr. Davis basically opened up his home and let me photograph. His uh, daughters were there as well. Uh, they're in the photograph we saw recently. Um, and my challenge was to try to convey a sense of the story in words, but not really in a traditional photojournalistic way. I wanted more to give a sense of the atmosphere uh, of the town and a sense of the tension uh, created by you know this person who is trying to fulfill his wife's dying wish out of an act of loyalty, but in doing so, he really uh, ran against social norms, and uh, there were a lot of uh, small town grudges. This is a town of about 2,500 people. Uh, he and the mayor uh, had had many run-ins in the past, and um, this resulted in a lawsuit that um, caused him to have to um, uh, disinter his wife's uh, remains from the front yard, which was very traumatic, obviously. So it brings up questions about how we deal with, um, you know, that kind of um, loss and that kind of rejection, our ideas about death and how we uh, portray death. Um, uh, a lot of the photos uh, don't deal directly with the story. For example, the photo of the, uh, the Jesus chair um, was was taken in the town, but it's basically it's a parallel to what's happening with him. Um, you know, the expression of religion is something very common, uh, but expressing in this way is very unusual. Just as his expression of devotion to his wife was very unusual, and how that um, seeing different examples of that in a small town and the sorts of things you see in a small town. So, I wanted to really just um, portray the atmosphere uh, in this town, how it's similar to small towns and these unusual stories that uh, talk about, you know, how we deal with, with uh, these issues, uh, largely surrounding a, a death. Great. As far as where, where this project is going to go, um, eventually it will be a book. It will combine the short story with the photos, probably not side by side, but um, separated so that it, it creates a bit of a mystery and then the, the story can resolve the mystery at the end. Great. Thank you so much and good luck with that. Um, and then the next um, artist's uh, portfolio is also um, a portfolio that intrigued me for the relationship of the written word to the picture, but this one <laughs> is a very different um, approach. Um, it's a, a series called To Make Believe, um, in which um, the artist, Maury Gort Miller, uh, has paired uh, phrases taken from Donald Trump's book, The Art of the Deal, with particular images. And um, of course, it's not a direct um, relationship from image to text, um, but rather somewhat um, Sometimes what seems to be a felicitous coincidence, uh, one of the questions I'll ask the artist is to tell us a little bit about what comes first, you know, the, the photograph, the, the phrase chosen, or how it works. Um, but I was drawn in originally by the pictures. One of the questions that he emailed to, to, to Judith was, you know, what do I look at first, the picture or the title? And it's always the picture. Um, uh, always, um, because I think we're just visual creatures. Um, and uh, to be honest, uh, it sort of took me a few minutes to actually look at the titles. And then I was thinking, well, what's going on here? Um, but I was, uh, I was, I loved the pictures themselves. And then um, understanding this kind of elliptical relationship. This one, for example, is called or the phrase taken from Trump's book is, I always assume women are never telling the truth. And then, you know, I already was sort of taken aback by this picture where um, this woman is, uh, you know, her head seems to disappear really ominously in this kind of thicket of, I'm not sure if it's red bud or what the flower is, not a bot mechanically oriented. Um, as she sort of stands there and, you know, her back is to us and it's very kind of vulnerable. Um, and then, you know, to think about all of the discussion we've had around um, sort of Me Too and, you know, uh, that, that, that title paired with this made me think about another layer. 
Um, and I think the next one as well, um, I, I have to say, I, I looked at it with new eyes just today, kind of getting ready for this talk, because I believe this is the one that um, the phrase from Trump's book was, I believe myself a genius in crisis. Um, so, um, but you know, there's also a wonderful sense of humor here as well. Um, the, the pictures themselves are kind of intriguing and then paired with this, these titles, we think too about what happens in the gap between the image and the decision to make the title. We reflect both on sort of the pictures themselves. Um, I'm gonna, artists are gonna have to come in and tell me what the title is, I cannot read it on this one. Um, but they hold their own as pictures and then they become more expansive um, when we think about the larger project as a whole and really the increasing kind of power of representation, um, you know, of, of sort of the of words in, in politics right now um, and the way that they're being used kind of as, uh, in terms of a battle. Um, so I'd love to now ask um, the artist sort of where the idea for this came from. Um, oh, this has got a great title too. I, I don't have it in front of me. So he's going to have to tell some of that. Um, but also um, how the process went in terms of pairing them. Um, and um, I'm going to open it up to the artist. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everybody. This has been a lot of fun so far. Uh, so in creating this series, Make Believe, uh, it had a particular genesis in terms of a date. Uh, it was uh, November 2016 uh, when I decided that I wanted to make a photographic series that embodied in some way um, what I felt was happening to the country and about to happen to the country. Uh, and I wanted to articulate uh, my thoughts uh, in an explicit way with pictures that I often like to make that are explicit in terms of a level of detail and acuity, but at the same time often tend to be rather open-ended and unresolved in terms of a what or a, a why. Uh, recently, the series that I've been working with over the past, let's say, six or seven years have become increasingly dependent upon text, and I very much enjoy uh, how the pictures are changed and modulated by the appearance of text beside them. Uh, Sarah, you mentioned the, uh, a gap, the gap between photos and text that I think is very, very appropriate. Uh, so that stirred me to consider his book, uh, first book, I believe first book, 1987, The Art of the Deal, uh, which uh, for any of you listening, if you haven't read it or picked it up or looked at it, uh, it is, uh, I think no matter your, uh, your affiliation, is a real page turner. Uh, you can pick, uh, turn to almost any page, I think, and uh, you will find some very, very enthralling passages. Uh, my uh, experience of reading the book, uh, it is as if every single page just drips with uh, a presented, uh, a particular persona and a great deal of what I call unbridled uh, and that was, was part of the fun of working with, uh, with this, this text. Uh, and so the approach I take is somewhat of a, I guess it's most clearly aligned with William Burroughs, uh, but I uh, recast and reorder text from one specific page in order to create these titles. Uh, and my aim with the text is to, at times, to deflate or undermine uh, the, uh, the egotism that I detect in the book and in the, uh, the, the uh, president's uh, many speeches that are on television. But at the same time, I also want to dig into uh, a, a capacity for elements that I see lacking in the book, such as humility uh, and engagement with uncertainty in a positive and healthy way. Uh, so the, the titles are meant to, uh, to poke uh, and to be a voice of dissent, but at other times, titles speak to what I feel as a, uh, a, an element of hope uh, for this country, uh, but also uh, hope for persons in power and politicians uh, who seem to ascribe to a particular notion of power and all-encompassing authority. Uh, in, in terms of which came first, uh, there are many instances where when working with the text, uh, I would come across and create a particular passage that I thought was very exciting and that would work well with the series. 
And at that point, I would go about constructing, finding a photograph, making a photograph that would either very clearly illustrate that text or on a much more tangential level would allude to that text in some way. And there were other instances where essentially the photograph came first. Uh, I would come up with an image that I felt was particularly uh, germane and also enigmatic to the series. And then at that point, my task was to find uh, a, a new title from a particular page that would juxtapose well uh, with that particular photograph. So it has it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I view it as a very personal uh, and understated way of making my voice known. Sorry, we had a question. I think the titles are really hard to see. Can we run through the slides very quickly and you just tell us the titles and then um, that would be great. Uh, I'm <laughs> just going to jog, jog my memory, but I will. I, will do I know that. this one. It's a good fire will destroy a beautiful apartment. I can read them if you like. That would be great, Judith. Thanks. Okay. So, yes, this one's a good fire will destroy a beautiful apartment, page 252. Okay. Um, this one is common people rarely have the courage or good fortune to recognize their potential, page 47. Uh, we talked about this one, but I'll do it again. I always assume that women do not tell the truth, page 87. I believe myself a genius in crisis, page 102. I can no longer distinguish between my dreams and vain illusions, page 341. Inside the maids talked of the dust of paradise, page 138. My father was ambitious at night and better with his hands than most, page 67. My policy is not to comment upon the hissing and screaming, page 183. What makes you think beautiful men have heard of you, page 95. And you can con the American people with a smile, page 60. Just so you all know, the, the titles are on the website gallery, so they are listed um, in all the images on the website gallery if anybody wants to review them uh, in the future. That's great, thank you. And um, our next um, portfolio um, also deals with um, kind of a really important issue in American culture. Um, which is Terry Darnall's work uh, as part of her series, Veterans in Crisis. Uh, um, so um, Terry Darnell has been photographing um, veteran of foreign wars uh, posts. Um, really, uh, I'd like to actually know the full geographical scope of where she's been going. It's a, an extensive series. Um, but um, this is a really important project that kind of draws attention to something that we a central part of our culture um, and of military culture. These um, outposts honored veterans who served in foreign wars, and as I understand it, uh, originated with the Spanish American War, so has been around for a really long time. Um, but as we see in these pictures, this history has been um, neglected. And I think that change is, I'm hearing some, I'm gonna turn off my mic, it might help the feedback. I'm gonna stop my own video. Okay, um, hopefully that's better. Um, and I think that um, we can really sense a change in attitude toward uh, members of the military and what it means to serve the country um, with these pictures. Uh, and, um, you know, these places that served as um, places where members who had served could share their experiences with others who understood them, could be honored, would have also social support. Um, we see in these pictures a lot of the beauty and the pride. I love the American flags and the way that they're painted in these different ways and draped. Um, 
but also a sense of a, of a generation that is passing by and that um, somewhat unremarked. Um, I thought this was a really great example of different ways also in which um, artists can think about different projects. We've looked at kinds of series buildings and this is um, a really great example of a kind of a typology of thinking about a bigger problem, but you know, focusing on one way of kind of exploring. And I love both the similarities between all of these different Talk a little bit about your project until we get Sarah back. Yeah, thank you. Um, I didn't start off with uh, thinking that I would have this project. I was um, just finishing up a project photographing Cheshire Bridge Road for uh, 12 years, and I had like over 100,000 images. And I really wasn't looking for another project but uh, right away, but I went down to visit with my mom in Florida, and I drove by this VFW post that looked really old and de decrepit, and I thought, well, what actually is a VFW post? I mean, I'm a veteran and I really didn't know much about it. My dad served in the Korean War and he was a member of it, but he never really talked about it. So I thought, well, maybe I can go inside. So I went inside and I discovered that actually I can be a member too because I served in the Cold War in Berlin. And I started talking to people and everybody treated me like I was their part of their family and the whole group of people we're like one big family. And I thought, well, this building's getting old and it seems like it's deteriorating. And I started asking questions and they were telling me that these buildings are going away rapidly because veterans are dying, the older ones from the old, you know, the older wars, and they're not being replaced by the, um, by the younger people. The younger veterans are not signing up to join the VFW post because they think it's their old grandfather's post. And some of them are doing really well and getting involved in the community because the posts are not just about the support for veterans, which that's mostly what, it, you know, what they do. Veterans support each other, especially war veterans, because they have so many issues when they come back from war, like PTSD, and they help support each other and get everybody integrated back into the community. But um, they also support the community and do um, other, other things for other people who have needs as well. And they're a big part of their uh, local communities. So I decided I needed to find out more about these VFWs because at their high point in the 1990s, there were about 9,000 of them. And today there are less than 6,000. And there were nine, uh, there were over 2 million members and now it's dwindling down to less than a million. So I wanted to get a representation of the VFWs around the United States. So I thought I would make a lot of road trips. So, so far I've, uh, I've visited 47 states. Uh, my plan was to do uh, all 50 states by the end of this year, but the coronavirus happened. So I'm not sure if I'll get to Alaska, Hawaii, and Wisconsin by the end of the year, but um, I'm going to try to make that my effort. But every, every single VFW post that I went to, I thought I'd hear a different story, but they all told me the same thing, that veterans are in crisis. There's over 22 veterans every single day that commit suicide because the uh, government doesn't have enough support structure for veterans when they get out of the war. So they go to these VFW halls, and now that the VFW halls are deteriorating and going away, there's nowhere for the veterans to go to get the support that they need. So I'm trying to make a national conversation about this crisis, and uh, my next uh, step is I'm working with the University of uh, Alabama Press uh, to create a book um, about this, and I'd also like to have some, you know, traveling uh, photography exhibition to get the word out about how we can better serve our veterans. Hi, Terry. I'm back. I'm sorry that I cut out, but I'm so glad that you stepped in, and, um, and that's great news about the book. Um, I had a question, um, too, that just came up for me, which was, um, to what extent um, do people who have served in the most recent wars, the Iraq wars, utilize the VFWs? I mean, is it, are we looking at a generational shift as well? 
Yes, so very much so. The, the younger um, veterans are not going to these VFWs because they think it's a, a VFW are for their grandfather's wars, not their wars. So when they go there, they can't relate to the same kind of war stories with the older veterans. So there's not really a national organization that is, um, that is came to place for these younger veterans who are getting out of the service and who have been in war. There's no place for them. Yeah, I think that's a really important um, point about this. And so what we're seeing also is um, the absence of what is needed as well as kind of the presence of these really important institutions. Um, I love that Wisconsin is grouped up there with Alaska and Hawaii. I have no idea why, but um, <laughs> just never made it. I hope that you get to finish the project. I mean, in a way, it's also a 50 states project. Um, which is which is really fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate it, and thank you, thank Judy. Thank you. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, it's probably time for everybody to pour a glass of wine while I continue on. Right? It is an opening after all. Um, and um, I'd love to um, talk about Eric's work. Um, so Eric Kunzman, um, this is one of the non-Southern uh, projects. Um, I was taken with this um, uh, project. I don't know if I'm going to say it correctly. Philosophic means, I guess, happy. Calculus. Technology is a mar social marker of race, class, and economics in Rochester, New York. Um, and to just sort of summarize it uh, briefly, um, Mr. Kunzman, moved to his studio to a new neighborhood in Rochester. Um, and when he did so, a lot of his friends and colleagues kind of reacted with, oh, you're, you know, you're moving someplace that's you know, dangerous and sketchy. Um, and he began to think about, you know, all of these issues around kind of gentrification and, you know, the space that we live in and how that is marked. Um, and, um, and also what characterized his neighborhood. And one of the things that stood out was that there were a lot of pay phones, something that you know, is really uh, kind of becoming obsolete in, most, in many places. Um, but instead of this project being a kind of fetishization of older technology, it's really looking at pay phones as kind of a vector um, for um, social and economic relationships. And, um, one of the things that um, he discovered is that, in fact, many of the residents of this neighborhood rely on pay phones, that um, many people still don't have cell service or reliable cell service. And um, so pay phones are really an important part of um, keeping in touch. So he set out to photograph the pay phones in the neighborhood. Um, and in a way, it also becomes a way to document his neighborhood as well. Um, one of the things I haven't focused on so much um, so far in my talk, but is, is the way that artists uh, decide what materials and format they're going to use. Um, I would love for Eric, um, oh, when I hand over the, the Zoom to him, um, to tell us a little bit about his chosen format. I think there are um, relationships here in these in these pictures to artists like Louis Baltz, thinking about sort of um, you know typologies and um, kind of characteristics of changing urban spaces. Um, I think it's also uh, nice to see um, a kind of uh, ongoing tradition of urban documentary photography um, in these really beautiful images. Uh, so I'd love to um, ask Eric now to tell us a little bit about uh, the process of making these and also his own choice of, of process here. If he's here today. I don't yes. know if he's here. Great. <laughs> yeah. All right, so this project, as you heard, I am, my studio for 10 years was by the Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York. It's known as the Neighborhood of the Arts where there's Memorial Art Gallery also. And in 2017, I moved up to the area, which is by our baseball park. Um, we actually bought a facility for my studio. And a lot of people were, I teach at RIT as well, the Rochester Institute of Technology. And even a lot of my colleagues there were making judgment calls. You know, that's, that area's a war zone. We can't have our exhibitions at your space. And I was explaining, I don't have a gallery any longer anyway, which I didn't want. And I got to know three of the nine-year-olds within first five minutes of backing up one of the trucks to unload 
Harry, Elijah, and Grumpy came over and they started helping me unload the truck. So I started to get to know the neighborhood, the actual people in the neighborhood. My kids play with these kids. And so that judgment of a lot of my colleagues at RIT and other friends really kind of started to become a little unsettling for me. And that's why I started to document. There were three things that people noticed, a lot of corner stores, neighborhood bars, and pay phones. And I fixated on the pay phones. And so I started, there was within about four square blocks, there's about 60 pay phones within my, the new studio. So I started documenting them. And then as I was doing that, um, came to realize that I was basically payphone hunting. And to get any further with the project, I approached the communication company Frontier and they sponsored the work by giving me the list of where they're all located. So in Rochester, we still have 1,455 payphones. And the reason why that's important is those 1,455 payphones is because Kodak, Xerox, Bausch & Lomb, our industry has died in Rochester. And so I'm trying to document all 1,455 payphones. I'm up to 937. Um, I might get rejected from some and then they don't get captured. But a big part of this is they're more environmental portraits of the people that might still rely on these pay phones. Um, there's, they're used on average, according to USA, USA Today, there was an article once every eight days. Remember, not all of them work, so that average accounts for all 1,455 of them. And a big reason why I'm still shooting film, the media that Sarah mentioned, is because Kodak's demise is a big part of a lot of housing here was Kodak employees. So I felt it was essential for me, number one, to view it and slow down a little bit as I was capturing it, but also um, the idea of, again, Kodak actually dying was a big part of it. So that's one of the reasons for me, it's all on Kodak film, it slows me down, but at the same time, it allows me to also have dialogue with a lot of the people in neighborhoods. When I'm not working with a digital SLR, but working with medium format, I have some of the most wonderful conversations in some of the areas that everybody labels as the most scariest in Rochester, New York, because of that. Um, so as I said, I have 937 photographs out of the 1,455, but at the same time, because Rochester is not the only city that still relies on the pay phones, whenever I travel, um, Tucson, Portland, other cities, we don't think about people relying on the pay phones because technology has left these people behind and that's one of the important parts that I'm trying to state and that Rochester's not the only one. Um, years ago when the Crescent City was run in New York Times by when Magnum Photography was in town, it made Rochester look like one of the worst cities in the, in the world basically. So that's why I'm also photographing other cities at the same time so people realize we, we are not the only ones with that particular issue. Uh, this series is slated to be at SEPA Gallery in Buffalo next April through July. And one of the other parts of the project I'm doing is I'm recording the stories of the people that are still relying on these payphones. COVID has put a wrinkle in this right now, um, but I've been buying payphones. The reason why I'm buying payphones is they will actually be installed in the gallery so you can pick them up and hear the people's story that are relying on the payphones at this time. Um, a last part of the project is allowing the community to go out and photograph them in Buffalo, come back and make prints, and then look at the social mapping of where people photograph them. So just trying to make people a little bit more aware of the judgment of how we label certain areas of cities is an important part for me as well. That's great to hear, Eric. And I, uh, um, one of the questions I had looking at these is you talk a lot about sort of their situation in the community, their importance to, to individuals. So, um, but of course we don't see that in the pictures. So the idea of being able to actually pick up the phone and hear it in the gallery is I think really, it's going to be really moving and, and add a, a, an extra dimension to the project. So congratulations and good luck with the show and, um, and continuing to get your stories. Thank you. All right. And I think we have another portfolio, perhaps um, one more. Um, Michael Joseph from Boston, where I came from fairly recently. Um, and this is um, a series of, um, it's really a, a, a portraiture series. Um, Sarah, I'm sorry, can I jump in for a moment? Sure. This artist statement is incorrect, um, and that is my fault. So <laughs> just I just wanted to let everyone know that this is not the story. So we might have to ask Michael to, to fill us in on that. 
Yeah, I think I actually know this other series. Um, Perfect. <laughs> but um, but uh, Michael um, uh, documented or went um, to um, photograph a number of people in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which has long been a kind of haven for the LGBT community and really a place where um, uh, people have the um, freedom to sort of be who they are um, and um, he made a series of portraits and again I'm going to ask him as well about his choice of materials which um, I know his other work was not in Polaroid um, but I was really I was sort of struck by um, the intimacy of a lot of the portraits and um, their kind of resonance too I thought with the use of the Polaroid with uh, Andy Warhol, perhaps a little bit in the background, um, but also the sense that, um, you know, Provincetown has become in some ways a very um, like she-she upscale place, um, but uh, that perhaps gentrification doesn't really come out in these pictures. Instead, I see a kind of um, intensity of the community where people are, are expressing themselves and really free to be who they are. Um, in a in a really tolerant culture, um, so I would love to ask Michael um, to tell us a little bit about um, this project. Uh, I think it probably also relates from his earlier work, which you did see the statement for, um, which was photographing um, primarily youths who um, uh, are on the street, have been homeless, um, but kind of exist as well on the margins of what we might consider mainstream society um, and really bring a kind of honor um, to to the pictures and I'd love to also hear from you Michael about um, the collaborative nature of portraiture in all of these um, and all these projects so I assume he's here I am here hello hi uh, <laughs> how are you so uh, this was a, a new project for me uh, this summer would be kind of year three or four of working on it um, and I tend to take a long time to work on my projects. And the reason is, is because I start with one person and then end up with another person and keep kind of digging deeper, scratching further, and trying to figure out really what lies beneath um, the surface, essentially. So um, Provincetown is a place that initially I went to maybe 10, even more years ago uh, at the suggestion of a friend, because from Boston, you can take a very quick, a very quick ferry out there and it really is a very different place than Boston is in the sense that it, you know, there's beauty there, but also you feel very much removed from city life. Um, so I, I went there for the day, I walked around, you know, got a lobster roll, some ice cream, and I didn't really understand or see what my friend was talking about. Um, and when I got back, he said, well, what did you think? And I said, well, I didn't, I don't know, I don't get it. He's like, what do you mean you don't get it? I said, I don't, I don't, I didn't really get it. And he said, well, you didn't really look deep enough. You didn't, you didn't experience what the people are experiencing there. And he was ac actually really right. You know, so as time went on, I found myself going back there uh, to experience what everyone else was experiencing. And you know, the Lost and Found project, which you're referencing, is black and white. And there's a lot of um, you know, um, heavy, it's a heavy topic, essentially. And I was looking for something that was a little bit more uplifting, but yet still exploring the themes of identity, of found family, um, you know, through portraiture, of describing a sense of, of uh, a community and a, a place, but you actually can't see the place, but you wonder what this place is like, given the, the, the images that you're seeing. Um, Provincetown in and of itself is, um, has a huge history. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that the pilgrims didn't land on Plymouth Rock, they landed in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And one of the first things you see when you pull up by ferry is the pilgr uh, the monument um, that you know is where the pilgrims landed, and so that's um, kind of the start. And then from there, it became a fishing village. It was uh, inhabited by the Portuguese, and then an artist community. It became a haven for many many writers, such as Tennessee Williams um, and artists over time. And so that really was you know something that I was drawn to, and it. It was always in the background when I would visit and go out, go out at night and have fun and go to the restaurants and do everything that everyone was doing, but I never really scratched the surface too deep. And as that other project was, it's not ending, but it was kind of, you know, winding down a little bit. I wanted to do something that was color and exciting and still 
get into people's heads and have that same closeness that I'm used to uh, photographing. But I also wanted to challenge myself in a little bit of a different way by, you know, not using digital and only being allowed to take, uh, you know, one, two, maybe three shots because with this Polaroid, the film doesn't exist anymore. And so I have to source it. Um, and that's kind of where it went. So one day I was walking down Commercial Street, which is a very busy street with lots of different interesting people. And um, I saw a little book in the window and the book was a kind of a pamphlet. I actually have it here. I'll hold it up for you. It looks like this, very thin, uh, very easy to read in about 15 minutes. And if you can see, it just says, um, Norman Mailer's Provincetown, the Wild West of the East. And so I was immediately intrigued and I thought, well, this is interesting. So I went to a coffee shop and I read through it and uh, basically gave Norman Mailer's thoughts on what Provincetown meant to him at the time that he lived there. And I didn't even know that he lived there. Um, and he had, he, he called it the Wild West of the East because there's a story that goes, you know, um, the Kennedys were living at a different part of Cape Cod and Norman Mailer traveled down to meet with them. And Jacqueline Kennedy said, well, what is Provincetown like? And he said, well, it's the Wild West of the East. And so that's kind of where this, this project started. And he had five main components that he felt the town embodied. One was freedom in like an, an artistic way, a sexual way, mutability, meaning that people could um, really change who they were. And maybe the, the person that you see on the outside starts to, sorry, the person you, that is on the inside starts to come through on the outside. I had a rule, of, you know, as I would photograph people that costumes were really not allowed because I always thought it was some type of guys or, you know, a shield. Uh, but the reality was that in Provincetown, the way that people dress is actually an expression of who they are inside. And um, when I interview these, you know, different people that I meet on the street, because uh, these are street portraits, all taken outside, you know, in real time, um, I can get a sense of who they are by how they're how they're dressing. And someone said, you know, I painted my my face a, a hundred different ways walking into town, and I found a place where freaks like me can be free to be who I am. And you know, that's exactly what Provincetown is about. Not that everyone's a freak there, so to speak, but um, it really is about self-expression. So he you know, said freedom, mutability, there's a tension there. And you spoke about how the town can be very she-she and you know what you're saying, kind of that, that um, element where you know, many people who have a lot of money are going and buying the houses and creating an issue between the people that grew up in Provincetown and live in Provincetown year round versus the, the visitors. Um, there are actors and um, you know, television producers and news anchors that, that have houses in Provincetown. Uh, but there are also artists that live there, um, you know, and, and many different people that um, struggle to make a living or people that grew up there. Uh, so there is still that tension that exists. It wasn't the tension maybe that Norman Mailer was talking about in his book, but the tension still does exist. And then there's also a sense of like um, a hauntedness. So when you're there in the winter, it's dead and there's really no one there. And you really see the ghosts of, of the memories of what you remember from the summer walking around, you know, seeing all of these different people. And there's a, a time where there's a, a big carnival, it's a big parade and you can envision the floats, but when it's snowing there and there's one person on the street, it does have that real element of hauntedness. And so that's kind of, you know, in a <laughs> long way of explaining it, where I ended up with this project. It wasn't something that I planned on doing, but I, I started reading through this and I thought, you know, I think this is what my next project's going to be. And so that's where I am. We really look forward to seeing where it goes, um, Michael. So thank you so much. Sure. Um, Judith, um, where are we now? Kind of what would you like to do on time? We also have all of the single image and alternates, which is just really the category of all the other things I wanted in the show. Um, and we can kind of go through them. Um, oh we're, yeah. We're, we're, we're good with time. We can yeah. go through um, Jin Woo's um, oh, yes. alternate yeah. portfolio. And then we also have the single images. So if That's you want right. to give Sorry. a yes. brief overview. Oh uh, yes, Jin Woo, I love this um, uh, portfolio. And I think he's on today as well. Um, this was Hi, a body. Sarah. Hi, this was a body of work that um, really intrigued me. Uh, for 
just the, the construction of the images themselves were so resonant and poetic and elusive at the same time. Um, and they emerged, from what I understand, um, from um, the artist's own kind of trying to understand his own place uh, in the world um, as an artist who um, uh, grew up back and forth between Korea and America and was sort of too Korean for his Korean American friends and too American for his Korean friends. And so, you know, kind of what is the question of is this dispersed identity? And the question of how um, one relates to these different homes. Um, and it emerges from his own personal experience, but I think the pictures themselves speak to a broader experience of kind of placelessness, um, of a sense of being of contingency and of being in between. We can show some of the pictures now. Um, and I think um, it made perfect sense to me as well. I could love this picture too with that column kind of just right in the middle sort of bisecting almost the sense that we're in two different rooms. Um, it made perfect sense to me too when um, I found out that um, the artist is also a poet and the words, the poetry and the pictures um, work together in, in, in his work. Um, the pictures, of course, a, a little bit like some of the other portfolios. Oh, this one I love. I think it's great. I thought too, I look at this again and I think about social distancing. We've all been kind of social distancing for a long time with our own screens. Um, but um, how, how pictures uh, narrate or don't narrate, um, how they create an atmosphere, a sense of feeling and emotion, and yet they do something that words can't do. Um, and so they can convey a kind of experience um, that we really can't put into words. And I thought that this body of work um, got at that and so visually rich um, and yet also elusive. Uh, so really a wonderful portfolio from um, an emerging artist. Uh, so uh, Jin was here, so I just invite you to come maybe say a few words about the series as well. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Judy, and uh, members of APG to prepare this wonderful show. Um, the series, Tell Them I Said Hello, uh, although began photographically about four years ago, uh, really began when I came to the States for the first time as a 19 year old. Uh, I came to the States by myself, uh, not having a place where I could call home. And uh, when I first came, there was a, a sense of alienation because I, first of all, didn't speak the language and I didn't have any context uh, culturally. So I spent about three or four years of uh, difficult times where I barely spoke because for some reason I wanted to speak when I could form a perfect sentence. And, uh, but after a, a long fought uh, three, four years, I adapted uh, socially, I think, and linguistically gradually. Um, and there was no, no more sense of alienation for a while. Uh, when I, when I became 30, uh, so 11 years after uh, the first uh, time I came to the States, I started to realize uh, the nuances and I started to pick up the subconscious uh, states of minds where uh, I'm realizing that I'm not although I'm a citizen of the States, I'm not exactly one of us here. Uh, and ironically, when I go back to Korea, which I did for about uh, pretty much throughout the years, at least once a year, uh, more and more I realized uh, my, f my friends and my uh, fellow artists and fellow writers in Korea viewed me a little bit differently. And again, uh, a lot of the times those things are said in in a nuanced ways and there are there are moments where i'm i'm seeing the way they look at me and uh, they don't say anything uh outlandish but it's there there were moments i was picking up i'm not exactly one of us here either in korea 
So uh, the sense of placeness kind of began almost as a monologue, uh, something I only picked up subconsciously, but realized that I kind of suffered through uh, for starting from the age of 30 when I was supposed to have been perfectly adapted and uh, the monologue became louder and louder and it got to the point where I needed to uh, get it out in a writing otherwise uh, it would it would have dr driven me crazy so uh, it the first two uh, frantic confessions and monologues of being an immigrant and also being an immigrant at home back in Korea I I published the poems I wrote basically as a monologue for myself. Uh, it was my second poetry book and it was very different from the first one. Um, but after that, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to transform them into a visual language from the written and so this series began about two years ago and uh, it, it, it if you look at the photographs, they are loosely connected, but I thought it was a perfect representation of my scattered identity as a, uh, as, a as an immigrant, but as a citizen. Um, and I intentionally chose uh, black and white because I wanted there to be less element so that you can focus on the content of the mm -hmm. photos and start creating um, your own context of alienation uh, and sense okay. of uh, discontentedness. Great. Thank you. That was really beautiful. And I look forward to reading the poetry too. Um, I'd love to send you one. Absolutely. Um, so Judith, um, that there were so many, so many great portfolios, even ones not represented today. Um, so many great photographers. It was really overwhelming. Um, and uh, the single image category is just sometimes a way to bring in a discussion of, you know, whole project I think is great or sometimes one image that, you know, you just, you just love. Um, and I think I'll just speak about these very quickly. Um, but I um, believe this is Anne Berry's work. It's part of an ongoing project of photographing primates in zoos um, all around the country. And I love the fact that she was using kind of a 19th century process. I think about the 19th century too as the moment of kind of Darwinism, but really the, the sort of beauty and the humanism. And this picture really makes me think about our relationship to, to animals and uh, you know the hard and fast distinctions we, we place between humans and animals. But of course, we're all part of the same. Um, we actually share a lot of DNA. Um, and then let's see, the next um, is by a young, uh, fairly emerging photographer, I believe Ashley Coleman, uh, I'm sorry, not so another picture that I realize now subconsciously I was responding to. It's part of a larger project also kind of reflecting on motherhood and what, it, you know, and parenting. Um, and I just, I love the sort of the detail here, the, the focus on, on this game that has been sort of scattered and the box that is tipped on the edge there. Um, and then the next photograph is really a project um, by Beth Wilkes that I, I absolutely just cannot wait to see in person because I don't think you can get any sense of this um, uh, on your screen. And, um, but she's been collecting uh, detritus. Uh, you get little details of there um, uh, from all over and kind of collaging them into these giant collages. And it's, of course, a, it's a commentary on our throwaway culture and you know, issues around environmentalism, but there's also this sort of wonderful grid-like you know, pattern that emerges and it looks like it could be an aerial view of a sort of a plans community. Um, so I really like the, the kind of tension between the abstraction, what we're seeing, and then I know up close you can actually see the, the kind of individual works. And then next picture as well is um, also um, a, a picture that really is about a kind of environmental um, history. And um, I'm sorry that I cannot see, I've just blanked on the name. So maybe somebody who has better eyes than I can, can read it. 
um, Judith, uh, Benjamin Dimmitt. Um, Benjamin Dimmitt. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. You're welcome. Uh, no problem. The title. So this is all from memory here. And <laughs> great at this point. Um, uh, but photographing in Florida and kind of photographing uh, over time and looking at the erosion of, of the coastline and erosion, um, you know, of these really important uh, natural features. But I also love this picture because it's really just like kind of just a demonstration too of how wonderful photography is with this, this mirroring um, and doubling and, um, you know, just the pleasure of looking at a complex picture like this sustains me always. Um, even as it has a kind of greater uh, meaning about um, the way that we're um, treating our environment and the kind of processes of erosion and destruction that are happening before our eyes. Um, and the next work is, I believe, by um, Brent Remy, um, and it's part of an ongoing portraiture project that um, he undertook in a studio building in Kensington, Philadelphia, and made portraits of the inhabitants, many of whom were artists. Um, just, uh, you know, it was part of a, a kind of a, a larger project that really honors a group of individuals. And um, I love this portrait because I feel so directly connected um, to, to the sitter. Um, and let's see. Um, uh, the next photograph is by Gary Bieber, um, and um, it's part of a, a, a much larger um, exploration of, of uh, actually urban spaces. I'm trying to remember where, and I'm sorry, Gary, if you're here, you can chime in and tell me. Um, I don't think he's here. I think he's here. Okay. So it'll be in on the website and in the catalog, um, but... Um, you know, I love the picture for the kind of formal rigor of it and, you know, the, the beauty of the tones, but also, um, you know, I think it speaks uh, to the end of an era of sort of dominance of American manufacturing. We can still read Sears, you know, each one on these kind of columns, um, but we see the negative of it. We see the letters have been removed. And so it really is just kind of the trace. It also made me think about a negative as, as well, the photograph you know, the negative and the positive image um, kind of being referenced in that work. Um, so it's a great uh, part of a larger, uh, very strong body of work. Um, and the next image that I chose by J.P. Terlizzi, who I think is here because I saw him in the chat, um, really intrigued me. It's a multimedia piece, I believe, um, uh, taking, uh, scanning archival photographs of his own ancestors, uh, family, sort of thinking about one's relationship, you know, and, and the role of photography to establishing one's relationship um, to one's family. Um, but also on top of this, we see these wonderful threads and then um, like specimen slides with, if he's there, he can chime in and tell me if it's true, his own blood. So thinking also too about different ways of establishing um, kinship, right? Um, through resemblance, through the objects that come down to us, the stories that come down to us about these objects, these people, but then also, you know, the physical DNA that we share. Um, and um, I'm going to just get to the last two, and then we can open up to questions or comments from the artists um, who haven't been able to speak yet. Um, and this is from a body of work by Polly Gaillard, um, who um, made, a, made a series of photographs about um, her parents aging. Um, and this is something, too, that is... Um, close to my mind right now, particularly because I have, you know, older parents who are um, isolated because of COVID. So I, I loved this really tender portrait of, of her mother um, several months ago when I saw it. And I look at it now with kind of a new sort of frisson to think about, um, in particular, the, the vulnerability and the, and the beauty um, of, of our, of our you know, parents and our aging population. Um, and people who are really not actually, you know, older people are, are very often caricaturized um, in, in Hollywood and in media. Um, so to see the sort of rich and full humanity and the really beauty, um, I just, it was very uh, lovely and moving. Um, and the last picture is by Ryland Steele. And I, um, and I thought about, um, 
to uh, uh, the kind of the, the quiet intimacy and beauty of this this photograph. I love the blue color and the way that it's not the blue screen, but it's actually everything else is blue. Um, but this boy really sort of on the cusp of adolescence, you know, on the one hand clutching um, a little teddy bear or a puppy, um, you know, still in boyhood, but also, you know, scrolling through the phone. And um, to me, it, it, it captured this moment of in-betweenness um, uh, of, of adolescence. And um, I know it's part of a larger project that maybe Ryan can tell us about. But anyway, that is sort of um, the, just a small slice of the amazing work that was submitted. Um, I hope that those of you who are in Atlanta do get to come see the exhibition. I can't wait to go see it. And now I think um, it would just be great to have a little chat. Uh, if people want to ask questions of the artists who are here or of me or of Judith or Chip or anybody, I think it's time to. Or anybody, yes. So um, if you want to um, maybe raise your hand so we can find you because there's a, quite a few people in here. Um, if you have a question for the artist or for Sarah, um, if you actually can raise your hand, there's a little reaction button there that might be easier than waving at me. Okay. All right, so. I just, this is Karen. Okay, great. Hey, um, thanks. I really enjoyed looking at everybody's work and hearing everyone talk about it. And um, yes, thank you all for all your work that you put into this. Um, but uh, Sarah had asked me, Excellent. do you, do you have um, eat? do you have trouble getting into these churches and I, I get a little flustered on zoom watching myself talk it kind of freaks me out a little bit so um I um I don't usually I ask you know I'll call the pastor and ask them I also work at a church um so sometimes i tell them that and that helps but sometimes i don't it just depends on the situation so i just wanted to clarify that great thank Thanks. you Thanks, Karen. <laughs> no questions oh i see hi hi susan is that hi, a question Sarah. hi i think there you go gotcha <laughs> Great, thank you. I have a question for Terry, and I, I love seeing all this work. I think it's fantastic, but I did have a question about Terry, Terry Darnell's work. Okay. I don't see her, but I'll just talk to you, Terry. <laughs> so, hey, how you doing? Um, She's here. Yeah, I think the work is really great, and the project just has so much heart and soul. And, um, you know, we have not honored our veterans in the last, I don't know, decades as they need to be. And we, they have not had the health care and the services that they need. Have you thought about maybe partnering as the work develops with, you know, uh, VA hospitals or people that are administrators who can use this as kind of a springboard, um, you know, I mean, there's a million places to take it, and I know you probably have many, many thoughts of that, but I just wondered, you know, how, how do you see it evolving, or where would you love to see it end up? Well, thank you for the, the question, Susan. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, there are so many opportunities, I think, that we could do for the veterans that aren't getting the help that they need now, especially the mental crisis. I met, my dad had PTSD from the Korean War, and so I think if he had help early on in his um, in his career, uh, he could have had a, a lot better in a different life. So that's one of the things that I'm very passionate about with this project is trying to find other avenues for veterans, especially the ones that aren't getting the help that they need through the VFW or through the government. There's other places like the Wounded Warriors and um, other organizations that I'm reaching out to. I haven't been um, getting a great response back from the VFW itself. So that was a little surprising uh, to me, but uh, I've reached out to them um, many times now and um, they're not contacting me back for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So 
if any um, thing that you you know can send my way about um, opportunities that you see uh, I could pursue, I'd love to talk with you about it because sure. um, I've uh, and I've just I've reached out to a lot of different organizations. Right now with the coronavirus, it's a little bit difficult, but as soon as we get on the other side of this, I really like to ramp this up and get a national conversation about how we can help our veterans. Yeah, I think it's a great starting point, a strong starting point for a conversation. And um, I hope it takes wings and flies everywhere. Thank you. One of the things I'd love to do is have a traveling um, photography exhibition at all the major airports. That's one of the, uh, definitely the, one of the things I'd like to see happen. Neat. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Other questions? Terry? Jin Wu? Uh, yes, uh, okay. I just wanted to briefly uh, take a moment uh, to thank you uh, to you and your father who have uh, participated in, in, in the wars. And being a Korean, we always remember the help we got from the veterans and the sacrifices you guys made and we still learn about it in the textbook and we we have an annual um memoir to uh, for the for those of who sacrifice their youth and their lives and their uh the sweats and blood so uh just wanted to say thank you and it was a wonderful experience to uh see them see the centers you I visited visually and in photographs. So thank you. Yes, thank you so very much. I've photographed 120 VFWs now and and uh, at least one in every state and some states many more, but um, I'm going to continue on with this project for as long as I can. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, great. Well, I think um, it would just be great to have a little chat. Uh, people want to ask questions of the artists who are here or of me or of Judith. Chip or anybody, I think it's time to. Or anybody, yes. So um, if you want to um, maybe raise your hand so we can find you, because there's a, quite a few people in here. Um, if you have a question for the artist or for Sarah, um, if you actually can raise your hand, there's a little reaction button there that might be easier than waving at me. All right, so. I just, this is Karen. Okay, great. Hey, um, thanks. I really enjoyed looking at everybody's work and hearing everyone talk about it. And um, yes, thank you all for all your work that you put into this. Um, but uh, Sarah had asked me, do you, do, you have, um, do you have trouble getting into these churches? And I, I get a little flustered on Zoom watching myself talk. It kind of freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> so, um, I... Um, I don't, usually I ask, you know, I'll call the pastor and ask them. I also work at a church. Um, so sometimes I tell them that and that helps, but sometimes I don't. It just depends on the situation. So I just wanted to clarify that. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> no questions? Oh, I see. Hi. Hi, Susan. Is that a question? Hi, I think. There you go. Gotcha. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I have a question for Terry, and I, I love seeing all this work. I think it's fantastic. But I did have a question about Terry, Terry Darnell's work. Okay. I don't see her, but I'll just talk to you, Terry. <laughs> so, hey, how you doing? Um, She's here. Yeah. I think the work is really great and the project just has so much heart and soul. And, um, you know, we have not honored our veterans in the last, I don't know, decades as they need to be. And we, they have not had the health care and the services that they need. Have you thought about maybe partnering as the work develops with, you know, uh, VA hospitals or people that are administrators who can use this as kind of a springboard um, 
you know, I mean, there's a million places to take it. And I know you probably have many, many thoughts of that, but I just wondered, you know, how, how do you see it evolving or where would you love to see it end up? Well, thank you for the, the question, Susan. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, there are so many opportunities I think that we could do for the veterans that aren't getting the help that they need now, especially the mental crisis. I met, my dad had PTSD from the Korean War, and so I think if he had help early on in his um, in his career, uh, he could have had a, a lot better in a different life. So that's one of the things that I'm very passionate about with this project is trying to find other avenues for veterans, especially the ones that aren't getting the help that they need through the VFW or through the government. There's other places like the Wounded Warriors and um, other organizations that I'm reaching out to. I haven't been um, getting a great response back from the VFW itself. So that was a little surprising uh, to me, but uh, I've reached out to them um, many times now and um, they, they're not contacting me back for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So if any um, thing that you, you know, can send my way about um, opportunities that you see uh, I could pursue, I'd love to talk with you about it because sure. um, I've, uh, and I've just, I've reached out to a lot of different organizations. Right now with the coronavirus, it's a little bit difficult, but as soon as we get on the other side of this, I really like to ramp this up and get a national conversation about how we can help our veterans. Yeah, I think it's a great starting point, a strong starting point for a conversation. And um, I hope it takes wings and flies everywhere. Thank you. One of the things I'd love to do is have a traveling um, photography exhibition at all the major airports. That's one of the, uh, definitely the, one of the things I'd like to see happen. Neat. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? Terry? Jin Woo? Uh, yes, uh, okay. I just wanted to briefly uh, take a moment uh, to thank you uh, to you and your father who have uh, participated in, in, in the wars. And being a Korean, we always remember the help we got from the veterans and the sacrifices you guys made. And we still learn about it in the textbook. And we, we have an annual um, memoir to, uh, for, the, for those of who sacrifice their youth and their lives and their uh, sweats and bloods. So uh, just wanted to say thank you. And it was a wonderful experience to uh, see them, see the centers you uh, visited visually and in photographs. So thank you. Yes, thank you so very much. I've photographed 120 VFWs now and, and uh, at least one in every state and some states many more, but um, I'm going to continue on with this project for as long as I can. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, question in the chat for Eric. Um, it's from Chris and Judy, which I don't know who that is. But um, how do you plan to get your project into the Rochester community? That's, it's funny, my, uh, my daughter, who's very active in my project, who's five, was running around when I was talking. I forgot to mention that part, I think. Um, well, first, there's actually going to be some lectures within Rochester. Our public broadcast station owns the local movie theater, which is um, the Little Theater. Before COVID, we were supposed to do some presentations there. And when I was in Mary Virginia Swanson's masterclass, who was on the talk, I don't know if she is still now, um, she challenged She's me. She's still here. Oh, she said, all right. She had challenged me that very question, which was, it's great to have in galleries, but that's only so much of the community. How are you going to make sure this story is told? Because the Frontier Communications was supposed to go bankrupt fairly soon. And Kodak and many other companies agreed that I could use their fences, to basically do a fence installation to make sure the city was aware that this is still a lifeline for people. The local newspaper, the free one, did an article on it. And then, of course, COVID hit. So the lectures were canceled. Right now, nobody's driving around to do that. But in the meanwhile, in the meantime of COVID-19, the communication company just claimed bankruptcy back in March. 
So this lifeline might be cut off from a lot of people. So I'm trying to reassess how we get this word out to the Rochesterians. But there are not-for-profits, believe it or not, out there in Portland, Oregon, that are installing free pay phones because of these people that are being cut off. Um, so that is something that is out there still, um, the idea of these free pay phones. So it's really making defense installations and trying to do more um, lectures to make sure the community is aware of it, not just in galleries. And that's thanks to Swanee. One of the things I was going to suggest is um, tell them about the news that you did. The news? The, the, the newsprint insert into the paper? Oh, no, that was actually a, a cover story. Had actually, the local free newspaper did a whole cover story about the news, the um, project. And that got out. And ironically, um, the local payphone company took that because we were talking about the social marker and how they're still being utilized. And they started taking them down the next week. So it was actually used the opposite from what I wanted to from the uh, free newspaper. So that was, um, it was a full article written by the editor because he wrote for USA Today four years ago. So. Oh, wow. Challenging. Uh, Any um, I'm wondering, I'm always curious to hear photographs that artists try to make but aren't able to successfully make them. And I was wondering if anybody had in their projects tried to make photographs that they were unsuccessful at making interesting as a photograph, even though they were interesting in person, and if they would be willing to share that with us. Question, do you have one? It sounds like you might have one. Yes. <laughs> I do. Well, I'm always trying to photograph um, these giant fly ash ponds, and they are just, um, I don't know, sublimely disturbing to see in person and insane looking. And then I photograph them, and they don't really look that interesting at all. So that's one of many, many things I've tried to photograph in my life, sort of unsuccessfully, even though it's quite interesting in real life. How about you, Eric, since you asked me? Um, for this project, it's more or less, sometimes I have to leave because people, even though I am working with film and the Hasselblad, if it's their territory and they ask me to leave, I will do so. So it's more or less just being respectful that way. Um, sometimes just have to go back and sometimes I haven't gone back yet, to be honest. I guess it would be more about that right now. And then um, Karen typed in a response. Um, she said, sometimes she goes to make a photo and comes away knowing she's going to have to come back because the light wasn't right or she didn't capture what, um, what, she, um, what she knew knew was there and what potential there is. Okay. Once photographers showing <laughs> us what they tried to get and what didn't work, right? We always see what did work and it looks like it's genius. Um, but for a number of photographers, it really is the, you know, it's practice, 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 you know, you mess up. And so I think more mistakes, being open about mistakes, you know, would really, it's so instructive. So maybe that's my next show, photographic mistakes. Oops. <laughs> Um, Beth and I were talking about doing a show at APG called Outtakes, all those things that don't fit in any place and are, you know, are just kind of like the, the odd man out. So maybe we can work together on something. Yeah. Those are the pictures you can't let go of, but they don't fit anywhere. Exactly. Because every time you do an edit or somebody does an edit, they say that one doesn't really work. So you put it aside, but you just can't let it go. Yep. Yep. All right, thank you everybody, this was great. Be sure to check the website because all of the work is on the website, on the gallery, there's a link to it. It includes all the titles and the artist information, as well as, you know, really check out our exhibition catalog. It's going to be fabulous. Um, it looks really great and all the work is, will be in it along with the artist statements and bios, as well as the image information and a fabulous intro from Sarah um, will be included with it as well. And she's like <laughs> making faces, um, but it will be great. Um, I thank you all for joining us. I think this was, this was really wonderful. We had a lot of great people here, um, lots of great information. The thing that I thought was really, 
really wonderful about this is you got to see the work and actually doing the juror talk in the gallery is sometimes difficult as the juror is talking. You're not able to be close to and, and see the work um, as they're talking about it. So this worked out well. And the other thing that worked out well is we had people from across the country. Um, Becky's in Texas. We had people from Ohio and Florida and California and Texas and just all over the place that just would have not been possible doing it in the gallery. Um, Michael, Joseph in Boston, and Eric in New York. So all of that was really fantastic, along with some of their, their friends and family joining from across the country as well. So thank you all very much. Sarah, thank you so much for doing a great job um, with, with selecting the images in the show. And I can't wait for you to come in and actually see it, as well as anyone else who would like to schedule an appointment, um, please just send me an email and I will point you to um, a calendar where you can, you can schedule your visit at the gallery. I don't have that quite set up yet, but I will have that if you are in the Atlanta area and want to come by. We'll do COVID safe um, visits to the gallery and you're welcome to stop by and actually see the work on the wall. Okay. Thank you all very much. Have Thank a you. wonderful weekend. Enjoy the holiday. Maybe get some sun. And um, we will see you at future APG events. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Judy. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Bye.